Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Michael Nutter, Mayor of the City of Philadelphia and President of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. I'm joined here today by uh, an array of great, great mayors from across the country. You'll be hearing from them shortly, uh, but let me tell you who they are. That's Sacramento Mayor Kevin Johnson, who is also the second Vice President of the USCM. Atlanta Mayor Kasim Reed, Salt Lake City Mayor Ralph Becker, Minneapolis Mayor R.T. Ryback, uh, and Columbia, South Carolina Mayor Stephen Benjamin. Uh, and of course, our uh, USCM CEO and Executive Director Tom Cochran is with us as well. We're here today on behalf of mayors all across the United States of America and of course the U.S. Conference of Mayors who signed a letter about the issue of sequestration. Hopefully by now you have a copy of the letter. It was signed by 131 mayors across the United States of America, a huge bipartisan group of mayors calling on leaders in Washington to balance the federal budget in a way that protects the interests of cities and our citizens. We're calling on Congress to eliminate the sequestration cuts and to take a balanced approach to the federal budget. We understand that this is not an easy issue. It was not easy for us to come together and agree on this particular letter. But as mayors always do, we got the job done. In that same spirit, we hope that members of Congress can come together in a bipartisan way to solve big problems. The federal budget can be balanced in three ways. More defense cuts, more non-defense cuts, and more revenues. We believe that all three are necessary. Right now, the sequestration includes only cuts, but cities have already borne more than their share of cuts to non-defense programs, like the COPS program, for instance. We recognize that further cuts may be necessary. However, we will oppose any budget balancing proposal that does not include all three of the areas that I mentioned earlier, including new sources of revenue. Every bipartisan budget commission that has looked at this issue, such as the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, more commonly known as the Simpson-Bowles Commission, has concluded that new revenues must be a part of any balanced bipartisan solution. So we believe that new revenues must be put on the table. In my own city of Philadelphia, the cuts that are scheduled to take place next January and beyond would have a negative impact in a variety of areas. Here are some examples. Cuts to public health would mean that the city of Philadelphia would clean 100 fewer homes for lead, reducing services to as many as 300 lead-poisoned children. Cuts in housing would mean that 80 homeowners facing foreclosure would not receive the counseling they need, potentially adding $1.6 million to the city's homelessness system. Cuts to Head Start in our schools would result in the loss of 400 Head Start slots and the loss of 30 jobs for teachers and classroom aides. These are just a few of the devastating examples that would come from this kind of action or in action by our Congress. We need Congress to adopt a budget that protects the working class, the middle class, and our military families. And the cuts I listed do not include cuts in programs that fuel the economic engines of cities, programs in research and science, for example, where cuts would hit Philadelphia's medical centers and our colleges and universities, tremendous employers and economic generators in our city and region. Cuts in the Department of Energy's budget would hurt research projects that are creating jobs at our national energy hub at the former Navy Yard in Philadelphia. We cannot afford more cuts that will hurt vulnerable populations and hold back progress. A federal budget plan that is pro-city is a budget that's also pro-growth. And so in conclusion, we call on Congress to limit sequestration cuts that further hurt American cities and to approve a balanced budget plan that helps the middle class, helps us to grow, and includes new revenues. And so with that, you'll hear from our second Vice President, Mayor Kevin Johnson. All right, I want to thank uh, Mayor Nutter, thank my colleagues, thanks Tom Cochran. 
Um, these are real issues for us as mayors, and we're coming together in a bipartisan way because we've got to make a stand and we've got to speak very loud and clearly to Congress. We need them to act. We need them to do something. We as mayors don't want to be on the defensive. We want to be on the offensive. And unfortunately, that's the situation that's before us. So the imp impending sequestration process is perhaps one of the biggest threats to our metro economies. And most of you know this. Our metro economies, both cities and metropolitan areas, we represent over 90% of the nation's GDP. We represent over 90% of wage and salary income in this country. We represent over 86% of the nation's employment, and we represent and will represent 90% of future economic growth. So when you think about cities and the roles that we play, we are where the rubber meets the road. If you want to get this country back on track and our economy moving forward, it's through cities because of our population and the impact that we have. These automatic cuts across the board are going to impact defense and domestic programs, which we know. It's estimated to reduce our nation's GDP by $215 billion, decrease our personal workforce earnings by over $109 billion, and cuts will decrease about 2 million jobs in just the first year. If this keeps up, you're going to see another recession conversation in 2013, which is not good for any of us. U.S. cities are the lifebloods of this country. Cities are where unfortunately, where we create jobs, but we're bearing the burden, an undue burden in this respect that we all believe, and we as mayors stand united in a bipartisan way to deliver a message to Congress. You'll hear from other mayors in a moment, and they'll speak a little bit about transportation, uh, community development and housing, and other discretionary programs. I want to talk a little bit about education. We all know our most valuable resources in our cities are our children. You can't have a great city without great public schools. Nearly every department in the Department of Education will be cut by 8.2%. Education grants to states and local school districts are supporting smaller classes, school programs, children with disabilities, all those programs will be hurt. If we don't get the sequestering issue squared away, it's gonna impact equity for young people, disadvantaged children. You're talking about a cut in $1.3 billion for programs that help our disadvantaged children. Special education will be cut over a billion dollars. These cuts, they talk about it's a silver lining. They won't take effect until January 2nd and impact the 2013-2014 budget in education. There's no silver lining for any of us when it comes to education and our kids. Let me bring it down to close to home. In Sacramento, we only have 37% of our third graders reading at grade level. So certainly, if you're talking about cutting early childhood education in our cities, you're going to impact after school programs, you're going to impact qu high quality summer learning opportunities for kids. All these things are what allow us to move the needle. We won't be able to move the needle if we don't improve public education. And if we don't invest in a progressive way, it's going to be negatively impact all of our cities and certainly the country. I will end on this note as it relates to education. In the next 20 years, you're going to have 120 million jobs that will require high skill. At the rate we're going, we'll be able to only fill 50 million of those 120. That means 70 million jobs will be outsourced to kids in India and China. That is not the competitive edge that we want to have in this country. And what we're doing, and we're asking very loudly in a very bipartisan way, is we want Congress to come back, take their gloves off, and have serious conversations about these issues. We all know that the lame duck session is upon us, but we can't afford to wait and sit around. And we're asking Congress to act now, and we have 131 mayors in a bipartisan way that is saying now is the time to do something very positive. So I want to thank Mayor Nutter for his leadership, my colleagues behind me, and I'd love to invite up Mayor Kasim Reed, the mayor of Atlanta, who also chairs our USCM Transportation Committee. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we came here today because we have decided as mayors not to wait. And basically there was some conversation about whether we should wait until after the election. Uh, but we believe that this issue is just too important and that there is too much at risk. There are two million jobs at stake. And right now the only proposals that are under, on the table as a part of sequestration are across the board cuts. Now, what that means for us in cities, you've heard from my colleagues, 
uh, what that means. But in Atlanta, that means the 50 police officers that we've hired, the 75 firefighters that we've hired to build a full fire department that are help, helping us achieve record lows in crime would be at risk because of the 8% cut. It would mean that the $100 million Atlanta streetcar that we are building, which has put hundreds of people to work, as we were asked to do by the federal government, would be at risk of a cut. It would mean that the center of the country's GDP would be facing cuts at a time when we need to be moving in the right direction. But the more important issue for mayors is simply this. We are not going to stand by in cities across the United States of America and allow the federal government to shift its responsibilities to us and go by quietly. We're going to raise this issue in 131 cities across the United States of America, and we're going to make it known that cuts without revenue isn't a cut really at the federal level. It will mean that those burdens and those responsibilities will go to cities that are already constrained and doing everything we can do to keep our city functioning well. We came here today to remind folks that cities are where hope meets the street. We don't get to kick the ball down the road the way that they do in Washington. We balance budgets every single year. We have to pay for our employees every single year. So some of you all might be wondering why we decided to have this press conference right now. We want everyone to know that regardless of who is elected, that we're going to be a part of this conversation and that these cuts aren't going to go by without us raising loud voices. And finally, we're simply asking our colleagues in Congress, our friends, to do your work. That's what we have to do in cities. We don't get to duck and dodge and hide. You all passed a sequestration measure as a last resort, not a first resort. So please do your work, Congress. Thank you. I'd now like to invite the mayor of Salt Lake City, Mel Ralph Becker. Uh, thank you. I uh, appreciate being here today with my colleagues, my fellow mayors representing cities and our communities all across the country. Uh, what you've been hearing from us today is a united cause. Uh, when Congress talks about throwing numbers around 8% cuts for sequestration, it's not a number to us. They are our residents, they are our businesses, they are our infrastructure, and they are the services we provide within our communities. We have all been through this recession at the local level. We've all made hard choices. We've made choices in every case probably where we have been cutting employees, where we have been reducing services that weren't, weren't critical services, uh, where we have imposed an increase in taxes or fees to be able to raise the revenues in a way that was responsible to our community. We're asking Congress to simply do the same thing, to make the hard choices that we need to make, and to make it with the realization and the sensitivity that they are affecting as we affect real people. And whether those are cuts to those who are most vulnerable in our society, like the Community Development Block Grant Program, or whether those are raising revenues so that we can have the infrastructure and transportation systems we need and want for our future, uh, we will work with Congress and want to work with Congress to achieve what serves our communities and our nation best. But Congress has to get to work to do that. And we look forward to being partners with them, with the business community, and with others to make sure we achieve results that allow us to move forward well and responsibly. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Uh, the next mayor who will be speaking is R.T. Ryback, the mayor of Minneapolis. Thank you, mayors. This is the wrong time to send a negative economic jolt into the uh, economy, and it is absolutely past time for Congress to get its work done. Sequestration is really just a fancy word for saying Congress didn't do its job and it passed the responsibility onto America's mayors. 
you've heard some great examples of what's happening in cities across the country. Think about Mayor Johnson's point about what this will mean for schools. Think then about the fact that those kids need to get to school ready to learn. Sequestration will mean cuts in Minneapolis and cities across the country in programs like early childhood, programs like our groundbreaking youth violence prevention work, programs like our Step Up Summer Job Program that's put 16,000 kids in professional summer employment. Walk through any city in America and you will see upstream and downstream effects of sequestration not getting done. Mayor Nutter used the term balance, and that's something that we understand as America's mayors. We understand that right now you have to make some tough compromises and get things done. You've got to bring people together from different sides. That's what we do every day. And so this will require balance. The Simpson-Bowles approach was balanced. How that gets done is up to Congress. That's their job. But the strategy is right. It says we're all going to have to give a little. We're going to have to cut some things we like. We're going to have to put a little bit of money on the table. And we're going to have to flat out get the job done. Now, I know folks in Congress are probably thinking about this through a lens of an election. We understand elections. We're mayors, OK? And Congress says, gee, I have to go back to my district and answer to people. Well, we are in the district every single day. The mayor is in the grocery store. The mayor is at church on Sunday. The mayor is walking through the park. And people come up to us and ask us questions. There are no elected officials in this country more in touch with the voters of this, this country than America's mayors. And I can tell you one thing. They're sick and tired of Congress not getting its job done. The people in this country want people to have a balanced approach to solving problems. That's what they say to us mayors, and that's why we get it done. So if the people in Congress are worried about making a tough decision before an election, they're going to really be worried about what they're going to do if they're not in Congress anymore, because people are sick and tired of Congress not getting its work done. So we really applaud the fact that mayors from around the country, across geographic boundaries, across party boundaries, have come together in this. And we really want to look the Congress in the eye and say, you've got a tough job. So do we. Don't make our job any tougher by not doing yours. And so now I want to introduce uh, uh, Mayor Stephen Benjamin of Columbia, South Carolina. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I want to thank uh, Mayor Nutter. Uh, for his leadership in bringing 131 mayors across this country together uh, with a central message. In Columbia, South Carolina, the great capital city of our state, uh, we have a bold vision uh, for moving our city into the 21st century. Uh, we aspire to become the most talented, educated, and entrepreneurial city in America. That's our vision. Uh, that bold vision is threatened uh, by uh, these um, uh, sequestration cuts. That are not, they're not well thought out, not strategic. In Fort Jackson, Shaw Air Force Base, Fort Jackson, of course, is the Army's largest training base in the country. Shaw Air Force Base and McIntyre Air National Guard Base uh, serve as uh, a major economic engine for our metropolitan economy, representing over $7 billion, $7.1 billion, $7 billion in economic impact uh, for our metropolitan area. Uh, sequestration cuts would represent an almost $15,000 job loss and $600 million wage loss across South Carolina. It's untenable in this time period in which we're all focused on job creation, job creation, job creation, uh, that we can have our federal government looking uh, at local governments uh, to foot the bill uh, because we can't get them to do their job in making the strategic and thoughtful uh, approach to uh, dealing with these major federal issues. We come here together unified. Um, we thank you for your presence, and I think I'll yield to Mayor Nutter uh, for questions. We would certainly uh, be glad to uh, take any questions uh, from, the, um, from the media. Uh, and uh, before uh, we, um, we do that, uh, we certainly want to hear a word uh, from uh, our uh, CEO and uh, great uh, leader of the organization and the staff, uh, Tom Cochran. Tom? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I think it's very significant that the press here recognizes that this is a bipartisan organization, and we have Republican mayors throughout this nation that are being threatened by the Tea Party and other organizations, on recall movements like we've never seen. And yet, these mayors are standing to their Congress 
and they're saying we need additional revenues to get us out of this mess. We also need to recognize that this is the worst recession since the Great Depression that we've ever had. And I've been with this organization for 43 years, and I've seen these mayors go through their budget negotiations, painfully so. We've had layoffs, we've had suffering, we've had pain at the local level, but the mayors have balanced their budgets. And we have in this country right now, jobs are coming back. They're not as much as we want, but they're coming back. And we, the, when, it's, when the history is written about how this country is coming back, we need to applaud the mayors of this nation, Republican and Democrat, for working with their private sector at the local level, while Washington has not done really a hell of a lot about this. So we're saying to the Congress, echoing uh, the mayor of Atlanta, and also reading Mr. Pincus this morning in the Washington Post, he says, you know, come back, come back, come back and act like adults. Act like adults, and I'll let you, I want to let you know something, that we have strong support from this. I was in Tampa with the Republican mayors. I was in Charlotte with the Democratic mayors. We're coming to town on this, and we're going to make certain that the city's interests are protected. That is the history of this organization, and I'm so pleased that we have these dynamic leaders, and I appreciate your leadership, President Nutter, as we go forward. Thank you very much. So be glad to take any questions. Uh, just do us a favor and uh, identify yourself or what uh, outlet uh, you may be from. There's a microphone. Uh, if it's a general question or if it's directed, please uh, let me know who you'd like to direct it to. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi, my name is uh, Jennifer DePalm, a reporter, tax reporter with The Bond Buyer. Um, my questions were t two questions. Uh, you, you mentioned concern about investing in infrastructure. Um, are you concerned at all about the ways infrastructure is financed, such as tax exempt bonds and you know municipal bonds, and the way that's the the uh, concerns or threats about tax exemption? And um, we did a story about if sequestration were to go into effect, the Build America bond payments would be cut significantly. So those questions, and just generally, all tax expenditures the impact they have on state and local. Um, where sort of does tax exemption lie for you guys and just in general um, some of the tax expenditures uh, priorities well, for you? Thanks. Thanks for the question. I mean, one, of course, we would certainly be concerned about all of those uh, issues. Again, as uh, local elected officials, as municipal leaders, uh, strength in the municipal bond market uh, is critical uh, for all of us. Um, but I think to your larger question about infrastructure, uh, one, we certainly need more investment in infrastructure, but I would also suggest that unlike everyone up here, uh, we not only balance our budgets uh, on an annual basis, but we uh, also have capital budget programs. And often they project out, uh, depending on the city, it could be three years, five years. Uh, we have a six-year uh, capital budget plan. The federal government doesn't. It's virtually the only government that does not have a capital budget that looks years out uh, as to where those investments are going to be uh, in the federal government's uh, infrastructure. And so uh, it's very difficult uh, to make long-term plans uh, when uh, you're dealing with short-term money. Uh, you know, passing a continuing resolution uh, is really not making a decision. It's putting off uh, the longer-term decision, and we make short, medium, and long-term decisions uh, we believe that the cities are going to be around uh, for a while, and we think the federal government is going to be around for a while. So start acting like it uh, and make long-term planning and long-term planning decisions and investments that help us uh, to put people to work and shore up uh, the nation's infrastructure. Yes, sir. The other part of that, uh, of that question, uh, the answer, really has to do with the argument about job creation and infrastructure should have been settled by the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. 10% of the spend to 12% of the spend went towards infrastructure projects. More than 30% plus of the net jobs created that are verifiable um, were generated through infrastructure investment. To the extent that the federal government fails to act right now and do its work, and it places pressure on the budget of cities, it inhibits our ability to go to the capital markets for debt 
to handle our own infrastructure. So we are handling our affairs in an orderly fashion. We are moving forward with infrastructure projects with very little federal support as it is. And rather than recognizing that, the federal government wants to add a burden to prevent us from doing what we know creates a real well-paying jobs. So there are two threats here. One, we already know that this is how you create jobs. Two, cities that are going on our own and funding our infrastructure projects without federal support. Its capacity to go out and bond debt um, is going to be adversely impacted because these folks won't do their work and because these folks are shifting federal responsibilities to cities across the United States of America. I think Mayor Reed has summed it up pretty effectively as a, as a um, bond attorney by practice as well. I think it needs to be made uh, clear in a, in, a, in a very clear declaratory statement, at least speaking from our perspective, that the preservation of tax-exempt municipal bonds must be uh, 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 upheld. It's, I think it's, it's sacrosanct uh, it's, uh, insofar as we're concerned. Uh, the reality is, as Mayor Reed uh, touched on and Mayor Nutter as well, uh, cities and, and counties, our, our, municip our municipality and the surrounding county right now, we're considering uh, the issuance of, of probably close to 200, excuse me, $2 billion worth of debt uh, to continue to help build our infrastructure, recognizing that the uh, ability of getting long-term funding and or support from our state or federal government just isn't there. So we're taking on that responsibility. Uh, the effect that this sequestration has on, uh, on our ability to do that uh, is, is, is frightening. And it's something that um, I think need, need to be stated declaratorily that we need to preserve uh, tax exempt municipal bonds. Next question. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Microphone. It's the uncertainty that's created of not knowing if there'll be a solution in November, if it gets delayed by some act, I mean, how does that affect your budget planning process? And I mean, what plans have you made or can't you make while you wait for, for an answer here? Well, I mean, the one thing that's certain is the, you know, the clock keeps ticking. Uh, we have a budget process established uh, in essence by our home rule charter. We're on a fiscal year uh, and uh, the next budget year starts uh, uh, July 1st. Uh, under our charter, we're supposed to have our budget passed 30 days before uh, the uh, the end of the uh, fiscal year, the start of the next one. So, I mean, you'd start working your way back. I mean, sometime in the winter, going into the spring, uh, I'm going to introduce a budget. I laid out th three of what could be a hundred examples of if uh, sequestration happens and those cuts uh, go forward, uh, we either uh, have to figure out uh, how do we fund those uh, programs or projects in a different way or not have uh, that serv service to be provided? But I would suggest that even beyond governments, sequestration is having a psychologically damaging impact in the private market, in the private sector as well. As governments find it challenging uh, to make uh, longer-term decisions, the private industry is facing the same challenge as well. That's holding back our economy because private businesses are also finding it difficult to figure out what is going on in Washington, where are things going, what decisions should I be making for my business, and uh, the business community makes longer term uh, decisions as well. The only uh, entity that seems not to understand uh, that there really is a future, uh, that there's something beyond the next uh, six months or beyond uh, any election cycle uh, is the federal government. Uh, and so I think that part of what we're seeing, the trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars, sitting on the sidelines right now, the companies could invest in cities and metro areas all across the United States of America, a part of that is the, the level of dysfunction uh, and uncertainty uh, created uh, by a process that virtually no one can understand, a word that virtually no one can even pronounce, uh, and worse, doesn't know what it means. Walk outside and ask the next 10 people you run into, what is sequestration? They're going to either say it must be a medical procedure or uh, it's, uh, you know, maybe a new flavor of an ice cream or something. It feels like a medical procedure. Yeah. <laughs> it's, going to, it's going to feel like one. So, I mean, no one knows what that means. I mean, what is that? Mayor, can I, can yeah, I yeah sure. 
take the point Mayor Nutter made and put that through the prism of a very basic service like fire service. Now, most cities have fire service at a local level, but this administration, thankfully, has delivered safer grants uh, to help uh, hire more firefighters. So we just got a safer grant uh, for firefighters in Minneapolis, which is allowing us to hire a new recruit class. But will that be then cut by 8%? There's also a new SAFER grant we've just applied for that is about the incredibly important goal of hiring new firefighters who have been veterans in the service. But that will now also be jeopardized. So what is a mayor supposed to do? Do you hire that recruit class? Do you go out and start recruiting veterans to be firefighters? We know how to do that with our budgets because we budget over a five-year period and make sure that that's delivered. But the federal government is pulling the rug out from under that, and that you can take that for every other local service that we have. What should we do? Well, we're right now tentatively hiring the recruit class, but we have to be looking over our shoulder and trying to figure out, do we backfill that? And what do we do about the veterans that we want to uh, bring back in? It's incredibly important to take veterans who have served this country and find work for them, and tremendous that uh, this administration has stood up to put people who put their lives on the line for the country and give them a job when they come back to this country. We have to go back to them and say, I'm sorry, we've got to explain this word sequestration to you, and somehow that's going to stand between a veteran who put their life on the line for the country and a good firefighting job that should give them a good place to uh, support their family back home. Yes, sir. Hey, thanks, Rich Eisen with the State Net Capital Journal. Um, nothing seems to move the needle much with this Congress. Um, why, why will this move the needle with this Congress? Do you have any indication, any reason to believe that this call will actually get what you're looking for? Well, you know, they talk about the journey of a thousand miles. Somebody has to do something. It is our responsibility to stand up and speak up and take action on behalf of our uh, constituents. And I think that uh, Mayor Reed uh, said it best that um, you know, folks are in an election cycle right now. We understand that. But the time for raising these issues and staying focused and starting to make some plans is right now. The election will happen. There's one thing that's relatively certain, at least in Philadelphia or in Pennsylvania. We're going to have an election on November 6th. The polls are going to open at 7. They're going to close at 8. Uh, and pretty much by uh, 10 o'clock at night, at night or so, we should have some sense of what happened. And maybe by midnight, we'll know uh, the whole thing. Fine. What are we doing on November 7th? We still have to pick up trash. We still have to fill potholes. We still have to make sure we have police officers and firefighters out on the street and that our kids are getting an education. An election will happen. It will come. It will go. Someone will win. Someone will lose. Now what? We took an oath to stand up on behalf of the citizens that we represent. That is our job. That's why we're here. And we believe that uh, there will be more and more voices added uh, to uh, this conversation. And we're going to help organize some of those voices. If everyone does their job, uh, we would not be in some of the circumstance or situation that we find ourselves in today. And so we've come to the place where we need that action. None of us, not a one up here or the 131 who signed on or many, many others who will uh, go on to sign on after today, none of us could run our cities and get away with the kind of stuff that goes on in this town uh, that uh, somehow uh, functions or serves itself up uh, as a service to the people, none of us could get away with this nonsense back in our uh, hometowns. We have things that we have to get done, and we do it every day. Yes, sir. Um, you referred to dramatic job losses in here, and the, the public sector has already lost about half a million jobs. Do you have any sense? 700,000. Do you have any sense of how severe? these could be, I mean, given what we know? I think it was Mayor, uh, I think it was Mayor Reed uh, that mentioned two million jobs are at risk in year one. Yeah, I mean, across the different cities, we don't have those uh, calculations here at the moment. But, you know, I mean, I guess, uh, I mean, I'm just going to say it. It should never get to that point. That's just irresponsible. I mean, it, 
where else do you create a situation where you say, let's put a dozen really smart folks in a room to come up with a plan, and if we can't figure it out, we'll do something else that is so draconian, so insane, that we'll put that out there as the thing that will make us do what we're supposed to do. Who else would create something like that? I mean, it's just, I mean, it's just really bizarre. So we should not have to sit around, quite frankly, trying to figure out who we're not going to have, what's not going to happen, how much more job loss. We're in still the aftermath of this recession. Unemployment is still too high. And while we're not the, you know, employer of last resort, I mean, we, do, we need folks to do certain things. It's not a technological way yet to fill a pothole or pick up a bag of trash. You need people to do these things. We need police officers, firefighters, and teachers to educate our children. And so, I mean, I just, you know, it's time for everybody to do their job. I'm going to leave it at that before I say something else. <laughs> Last question. Am I? Okay. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs>